Now we are ready for our first panel. Does value investing work in India? Is it difficult to find value stocks in our market? To tackle the subject, we have Dr. Vikram Kurian, Executive Director, Center of Investment ISB, who has graciously accepted to moderate this session for us. May I request Dr. Kurian to please join us on stage? To join Dr. Kurian on stage, we have Mr. Bharat Shah, Executive Director, ASK Group, Mr. Kenneth Andrade, Head Investments, IDFC AMC Limited, Mr. Parak Parik, Founder and Chairman, PPFAS, AMC Private Limited, Mr. Sankran Narain, Chief Investment Officer, ICICI Prudential AMC Limited. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, uh, good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure being uh, at this panel. It's a fascinating topic, value investing, perhaps the most dominant uh, style of investing uh, uh, sort, of, sort of practice worldwide. The greatest uh, compounders of capital claim to be value investors. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, we have a very, very distinguished panel here and uh, long, long periods of experience. And so I'm going to get right into sort of value investing, if you will. So I'm going to uh, pose the first question to uh, Shankaran on my left. Uh, uh, Shankaran, th there are many, many different styles of value investing. You know, there's Graham and Dodd, sort of deep value. There's Warren Buffett, Moat, uh, you know, long-term compounding. Uh, Howard Marks, right? Uh, wh what's the style that you've sort of come to now, and you know, how, how has that evolved over time? Basically, over a period of time, you watch what uh, what you think is most appropriate from an institutional context in value investing. Uh, you know, I went through a phase of trying to invest in low price to earning, low price to book stocks, and I realized that it works for uh, six months in a five-year period, where you get all your returns in six months, but the remaining four and a half years doesn't turn out to be a good period. So I, finally, I feel that you know, from an institutional context in India, uh, contrarian uh, value investing seems to work because you know you have uh, periodic moods of greed and fear, and uh, you get an opportunity to invest when others turn pessimistic in a particular sector. And uh, similarly, there are times when people get very positive on a sector, and you get an opportunity to exit. So I would say a contrarian model tends to be far better, uh, particularly for uh, an institutional investing framework. And uh, having adopted that, I believe it has been a very comfortable uh, investing experience. See, the advantage with a contrarian model is that, you know, one of the constraints that uh, we would have is that we would have to deploy good sums of money and uh, because you are on the other side, what happens is it becomes very easy to deploy money. And even though the money becomes larger and larger, it becomes pretty easy to deploy with a contrarian style. And that experience, that has been my personal experience. I mean, from an investor point of view, I would say that, you know, a classic buy and hold, but you invest once in 10 years, that kind of opportunity is possibly the best but uh, how many investors are people who can invest after a World Trade Center bombing or after Lehman failed? That would be only less than 5% of the investor, in, uh, total investor people. So I would actually advocate that if they can do that, but I doubt whether people will be able to do it. That's what I have from my years of watching value investing in India. Very good. So, so as uh uh, as sort of a student of, of the market and the fact that you manage large amounts of money, you sort of evolved your style to, to, to really suit your profession, if you will. As an institutional value investor, you've got to invest large amounts of capital uh, and you're more interested in more consistent returns rather than in outsize returns which may come from a hardcore value investing. Uh, you know, you sort of evolved your view some. some yeah. uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me move to somebody who uh, who doesn't claim to be a value investor, and, but has done extraordinarily well, and 
if, if, you're, if you've done so well in the markets, you know, in some sense, you've got to be picking something that's undervalued, right? So, so Kenneth, maybe you can, you can just describe, you know, your, your own investment philosophy and where you differ from sort of a value approach. I think uh, all investments come in at the right price. Okay, and uh, once you've been able to identify the right company, um, effectively you sit on it for an extremely long period of time. So then you watch execution. Because uh, good execution usually shows up in, uh, in valuations. And over a period of time, it remains, ex it, it, it re remains expanded for an extremely long period of time. So effectively, uh, an investment, the investment thesis always, always begins when you have lesser amount of money to lose. Okay, so you get your pricing right. And then uh, once you've been able to identify the, the company, uh, the space has to be scalable. It's got to be a significant, uh, it, it has to be a significant industry for a company to grow into. And uh, if the company has been, uh, been, been executing right, I think uh, you, that's, that's probably the best strategy that works will work for me. I think that's a good description of your, your strategy, but you sort of dodge the question of is it value investing or do you term this sort of more growth investing? Um, I would want to put a context around it. Yeah. Okay. It always starts from the fact that you get it right as far as your purchase price is concerned. Over a period of time, uh, if you can predict the, uh, uh, the long-term growth of a business, okay, the stock might still be valuable in the near term. Uh, the other extreme is uh, uh, other extreme is if you have to buy a good franchise at an expensive price, you probably have to give away a year or two of return just to make sure, as, a, as, as an in, in an institutional framework, you can accommodate the size and the scale. So yes, um, we're not really typically the value value investor, but price is an important. But the value that you pay when you get into the company or when you purchase the company is very relevant at, at, at the initiating of the idea. Yeah. Thank you, Kenneth. You, you know, just my paraphrase is that uh, clearly you're looking for high quality companies and if that have a growth runway and if, if you're buying them at an affordable price, because you keep saying price is a very important part, you know, my subjective classification, I'd still sort of put you in the, in the value type category, but you may not be so happy with that uh, <laughs> categorization. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, we, let, let's, let's move to... Uh, uh, you, you know, Bharat, uh, you, 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 you sort of talked about your investment philosophy having elements of both value as well as growth. And perhaps you can just elaborate a little bit about, you know, your philosophy and, you know, wh how that has also evolved over time. Yeah, yeah I, <clears throat> I think uh, I've always believed that the debate between value and growth is a very artificial debate. Because if a business is not going to grow, I don't think there is any value at all. And uh, uh, for a uh, growing business to be bought and to make investment returns, it must have a component of value uh, defined as say, margin of safety or a price value gave. So I think both are the sides of the same coin and trying to put it into two straight jacketed categories of one thing called uh, value and the other, co other thing called growth, to my mind is a very sterile and artificial debate. That's one. Second, uh, it's important to uh, kind of uh, put in place what exactly people mean by value. It's quoted often, but what exactly is meant by value is uh, a pretty amorphous idea. I mean, if by value you mean mere cheapness, uh, of an arithmetical variety, I'm not very fond of that. Because arithmetical cheapness is dime a dozen. I mean, in uh, supposedly market uh, today, which has gone up, out of some six or thousand stocks, you still will get 70, 80% of the market at a price earning mathematical number of less than 10 or in a single digit. So that pure cheapness or cigar butt kind of investing that Graham was very fond of, I'm not very fond of. Graham's ideas were formed during the times of Great Depression. So his thinking was colored by that. And obviously at that point of time, everything was so cheap because markets had lost 87% from the peak. So everything was cheap. So anything that you chose by whatever parameter was likely to be quite cheap. 
But uh, I think Phil Fisher has taught us that ultimately without the element of quality, pure mathematical cheapness has very little relevance and meaning. So I would say to my mind, uh, uh, the business if it is to have a value, it must have a growth. But growth in itself is not adequate till it is supported by the quality of growth. But when I say quality of the growth, I mean the capability of a business to create a superior economic value over a period of time, which essentially will come from the character of business and which is more often than not likely to come from return on capital employed and its ability to generate it on a superior basis for a long period of time. Finally, uh, uh, also the second element of quality, which is not immediately linked, but is the quality of the people behind the business, which to my mind is equally important because by definition, 80% or more number of managements are simply not trustworthy and uh, simply not the ones, uh, and I'm being conservative when I say 80%. So to that extent, the quality part is an integral part of that growth, apart from uh, growth itself. And finally, the package is to be bought at a price which is a sensible uh, discount or correlation with what one defines as the uh, intrinsic worth of the business. I think it is the amalgam of the three, to my mind, represents uh, the, uh, if I have to define it as a value, then that. Thank you, thank you Bharat. So that was a sort of a fairly deep uh, articulation of how value and growth to quote Buffett, are joined in the hip, and 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 you know you also articulated a little, you know why pure value may not may not be that attractive in a country like India. Uh, let, let's let's sort of get the audience in. We we had a poll, and uh, you know c can we have the results for the poll? I think the question was does value investing work in India, and uh, c can we have the poll? I don't know how we read the answers to the poll. Uh, is it going to be flashed up on the board? Uh, the results are sh shocking. I mean, to me, shocking. I mean, <laughs> that's a really good question. It'd be, it'd be good to find out how many voted. It was, it was, it was, it, it was. It was uh, you know, in some sense, this is a mathematical impossibility, right? If everybody is a value investor, there will be no values in the market, right? So, so there's something awry, yeah. I think even the investing now has become a voting machine rather than a weighing machine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's right, that's right, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I think that's a good segue to move into, uh, uh, to, to move to Parag. Uh, and we've had some discussions, we exchanged some emails also about this, is, is what type of value investing works in India? I would say that the Warren Buffet way of value investing would really work in India. We are buying a business and have a margin of safety. And uh, it's difficult for the Benjamin Graham style to work of the cigarette, uh, the cigarette butt of a value investing style is because we don't have corporate traders over here who can unlock values and the legal system also. We have courts of law but no courts of justice. So if someone just tries to do something, it will take years and years before the value is unlocked. So in this sort of a system, I think the Warren Buffett's philosophy would work very well. That, that's a great uh, articulation and I'll sort of repeat some of these points because for me, uh, it's sort of a reason as to why the Warren Buffett style, you know, all of these guys sort of uh, say it, works in India or Whereas in the rest of the world, some of the other things, other styles of investing, also value investing, also work. And the main reason, as he correctly articulated, is that it's almost difficult to change management in India. So you don't have corporate traders, you don't have activists, you don't have people who, who, who can enforce shareholder rights. And as he also largely pointed out, you know, the legal system is such that you cannot enforce uh, shareholder rights. You know, you file a suit in the court, you may be dead by the time the, uh, by, uh, the, the thing comes for hearing. Yeah. Um, Brad, uh, you, you also mentioned something else which I think is absolutely interesting and fascinating, which is that you think it's important that investors in India have overseas exposure. Yes. Can, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? <coughs> yes, you know, normally in behavioral terms, you suffer from something which is known as a home bias. 
so you are always interested in investing into a place where you live and you don't want to go abroad now today the government has allowed individuals as well as mutual funds to invest abroad so i believe that uh, if you are really looking at great innovative companies uh, in uh, uh, research dominant companies in pharma technology upstream companies in oil and natural gas and uh, something like arbitrage like nestle over here is available at about 45 times earnings and if you buy the parent over there it's around 18 times earnings i think there are a lot of great opportunities when you are really looking at buying a value so i think uh, uh, people should be really thinking of going abroad because what you are trying to restrict yourself is investing in india which is only 6% of the global economy so 94% of the global economy you are just leaving it and everyone can do it so i think that's one great opportunity so so strong proponent for investing globally as opposed to uh, being restricted to india yeah um, let, let let's move a little bit more uh, uh, you, you know sort of evaluating sort of investment philosophies and shankran i'll come back to, uh, to you uh, you're a, you're a fan of howard marks and there's a sort of a quote uh, a nice quote by howard marks where he likes to invest in a good company that has a bad balance sheet as opposed to a bad company that is challenging to turn around uh what are your thoughts about that kind of philosophy you know contrarian type philosophy applied to applied in the indian context see what i learned from howard marx is this basic theory of cycles and uh, i find it uh, very fascinating when i uh, see how things evolve because uh, there are periods of time and uh, for example take a asset class like real estate between 2002 and 12 it kept doing well that by 2012 almost everyone believed that real estate can never do badly if you go to fixed income between 2004 and 2014 for 10 years uh, fixed income has been a bad asset class so people believe that how can fixed income do bad, well so what i learned from howard marx is uh, these cycles keep happening and uh, one can't forecast them because one can't forecast them people actually at the end of a big bull cycle people lose their uh, logic and at the end of a big bear cycle people again lose their logic so that is what i have learned and if you see even in india there are periods of time like 2007 when quality stocks were dirt cheap and uh, aggressive companies were very costly or a year like last year where uh, quality stocks were very costly and the aggressive companies were very cheap so what we've seen is that you know from a institutional investor environment i find it very interesting that these cycles operate and uh, if you have the ability to think long term you can always uh, act against the current cycle at work at a point of time and uh, make money and uh, that's what i've learned from howard marx because going back to what parak said for me to change a bad management or to change a to change a, make a bad management good those are all very difficult things to do so you know that part of it uh, doesn't work so it's much better for institutional investors to focus on cycles but uh, i think the basic problem is that there'll be finally a bubble and maybe in 2018 at that point of time how to ensure that the investor base realizes that there is a bubble and stays rational that is going to be the real job or uh, which which i think today when we are not in bubble we can't talk about it but when when the bubble happens how people will behave that's going to be still fascinating for me absolutely yeah so 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 learning from your guru what howard marx practices overseas is very difficult to practice here for the reasons that parag just said uh but you've learned sort of cycles and you also mentioned and we we already addressed this a little bit that the principles of value investing can be applied to multiple asset classes and i think you gave some examples while we were talking earlier about real estate and maybe you can you can share that with the audience about real estate uh you know yields versus interest rates here versus japan versus elsewhere 
Yeah, but basically I view value investing in any asset class, I look at four things. One, whether there's fear. If there's more fear, it's better. Uh, the second is if their past returns are bad. Uh, the third is uh, you don't see too many people investing in the asset class. And fourth is valuations. And valuations, you know, if you look at it, uh, you have to look at keep the cycle in mind, as Howard Marks says. I've seen that once you put these four things in perspective, you normally come to a situation where you know which is the asset class which is, uh, which is, not, is not attractive. If you go back to real estate in 2012, clearly you had 10 years of bull market, so past returns were fantastic. There was no fear at all for anyone to invest in real estate. Uh, flows were very high. Almost everyone was buying a second house or a third house or leveraging to buy real estate. And uh, you had valuations in real estate, I defined as comparing mortgage rates with rental yields. Because uh, there was nothing else that I could do because I'm not a real estate person. That's right. Yeah. So I found that, you know, once you put these four things in any asset class, look at fear, look at past returns, look at valuations, and look at flows, you know which is the asset class which is, uh, which is most attractive from a value investing point of view. And I, I found that to be in line with what Montier says, be unconstrained. So if you're unconstrained and you're willing to look, there'll be a period of time when equities may not be a value asset class, but uh, some other asset class will be a value asset class. And I found it works. It is just that you should be willing to be long term and not look at the next three months because in 2012, no one would have known that the next two years equities will do so much better than real estate. But in 2012, almost no one could have predicted it. So when did the turn happen? No one knows. It's only in retrospect we know when the turn happened. So these kind of things keep happening. But I would say that if you want to make money in the long run, there is no choice but to apply value investing principles not only to equities but to every asset class which exists. F fabulous and very important point is that the, the principles we're all talking about can actually be applied in almost every asset class. Right? Uh, but, but let me ask you something else about sort of principles. You know, a lot of us here, you know, went to business schools, we, we learned a lot of complicated theories, uh, you know, things like volatility, beta, and things like that. How does it apply in your mind in the practice of value investing? Well, the, uh, my answer would be in general to the many theories rather than to any particular one. Uh, of course, a theory uh, in every field of a study has a value in a sense that uh, theory is an intellectual construct and to that extent in any intellectual construct uh, which is uh, comprehensive and tries to accommodate all the different interplaying variables and builds about a kind of a thesis or an idea, uh, from a rigor point of view, is a very important uh, thing to understand and study. But the trouble comes about uh, when, in a very mechanical way, theories are sought to be applied to a very practical business like investing. Because if, if it were to be so cut and dried, uh, then those Bell Laboratory uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist in 80s uh, would have continuously done wonderfully well, but they did not. I mean, after the initial hurrah and euphoria, uh, all those very sophisticated, complicated models that they put into the machines, uh, they worked for a while, and when it burst, it, won it burst in a very, very bad way. And that included some four Nobel Prize winning guys simultaneously. So I think. Uh, uh, world lost uh, some very fine physicists and the investing world got some very bad uh, uh, investors actually. My, my general belief is that um, so many of these theories, uh, honestly speaking, beyond the point leave me, in a, uh, leave me a bit vacuous because uh, uh, something like investing uh, while you need to understand the principles and the fundamental concepts, but it is the practicing of that which is at the core of a good sustained long-term results, which is why they keep saying again and again that investing is uh, simple uh, but not easy. It's simple to understand, 
but it's so difficult to practice. And it is the practice part when it is not built into the computation or understanding. A simple idea like behavioral pattern of the participants. If you can't take into account that idea, then you do not, uh, you cannot practice the craft well. If you mechanically try to follow the idea of uh, value is, so to say, cheapness, uh, then again, uh, that's something which practice has shown again and again that it has failed. I mean, to give you one example, if you take last 15 years, uh, Nestle has the lowest price earning multiple that Nestle has quoted in 15 years is 22 times. Now, if the lowest multiple in 15 years is 22 times, that should tell you something. That if you are defining the valuation as merely some mathematical number, it's more likely to be a honey trap than a reality. So I think many of the popular theories come. Some acquire currency. Uh, some die a natural death because uh, they fail the test of validation by the practice. Um, those which have intellectual rigor and practicality are the ones which uh, uh, go for long. But I am all for the practicing the craft of investing rather than uh, into the grandeur of uh, theory of everything in investing. Thank you. That's, that's a very articulate uh, description of the difference between academia and practice and the reason why practice is, is so important and so different from, from, from academia. Uh, you know, Parag, you, you've mentioned something to the same effect uh, in slightly different words. Or sort of, uh, I think the words you phrased was, you know, the law of God versus the law of man, right? Do you, do you, can, you, can you articulate that, those ideas uh, a little further? Sure. Yeah. Uh, whenever we are really looking at investing, first is you have to uh, understand that you are buying a business and not a piece of paper which will tomorrow go up or down depending upon how the sentiment of the market moves. So when you are buying a business, the most important part is you got to understand how the system works. Uh, there are certain laws which are made by men and these laws are changing always and they are manipulative in nature like those laws which tell you you short and you make money you do futures options you make money think you give him an upfront commission and then you get more clients these are all short-term manipulative tactics on the other hand there are laws which are made by God and these are known as the universal principles and one of the universal principles is the law of the farm. You cannot sow something today and reap tomorrow. A seed has to go through different seasons before it turns into a fully grown tree and starts giving fruits. So when you are really looking at value investing, it's boring. Like Naren mentioned, four or five years you will have to wait. So ultimately people want to follow value investing. But then they miss out on the waiting part. It's basically the waiting which is the most difficult part. You can learn all those things and invest. But unless you have a long term view, like imagine you have to grow grass, every day you water it. You may not see something just coming up. It is, it's a, it is going to be very boring, but in the long run, ultimately it's going to help you. Thank you. Yeah. Just one small point. Yes, Sorry for that, but uh, I mean, in the uh, business schools, uh, they teach you higher the risk, higher the return. And I've learned that in my MBA class too. But over a period of time, I realized how bunkum that idea is. Uh, actually, it is in investing only if the risk is meaningfully low that you can hope to have a good return. By pursuing some bizarre risk, is a definition for a recipe of good return is a very, very poor idea. But that's what the business schools teach you as a theory. And while it may apply probably to asset classes per se, some assets are more risky than the others, but within an asset, security selection within each asset class can only be lower risk and higher return rather than the other way around. Extraordinarily important point, uh, you know, and, and again, how value investors differ from traditional 
uh, sort of finance, you know, even purveyors of asset allocation software like our sponsor today, that the difference between, you know, risk is not, is not necessarily volatility is, is essentially what you're, what, you're, what, you're, what, you're, what you're trying to make. Yeah. Um, uh, let, me, let me move a little bit, uh, uh, shift gears back to somebody who's, who's, who's sort of a value investor in my mind, but he's, he's, he, he, he differs. Uh, but, but you know, one of the advantages, Kenneth, or maybe your style of essentially looking for high-quality companies is you're able to avoid what we'd call sort of value traps. Uh, is, is that a fair characterization uh, of, 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 of the way you approach? You will never get caught in a value trap. Would, would that be correct? I mean, uh, predominantly, it's a search for a good business. It's a search yeah, for a great it's business. It's a good, good yeah. business will get better. And in that entire process, um, I mean, we're not really into the discovery game of the business or buying, a, incubating a business that will be good. So, so I guess in, in a certain way, businesses are mature. Uh, we don't buy it very cheap or we don't pay a disproportionate amount of, uh, of, of, of value for it. Uh, but the predictability of understanding the uh, the environment that it operates in, and uh, the ability of the company or the, or the management to actually execute into that environment, is extremely critical. Great, uh, thank you. Now, now let me sort of ha ask sort of an open-ended question to everybody. Some of you are sort of institutional investors, you know, uh, managing very large amounts of money. Uh, some of you are are more more open. Uh, and I'm going to open this to everybody on the panel, really, is suppose there were no constraints, right? Uh, forget about long only, right? If you could, if you could go, do other things, for example, if you could short, if you could trade, if you could concentrate, if, if you were essentially operating a hedge fund uh, where there are absolutely no constraints, uh, what would you do? And, and maybe I'll just, you know, walk from this way around. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'll continue to do what I love, uh, which is to buy for long term, uh, uh, pick value as I define that value, and sit on it and uh, enjoy. I wouldn't do shorting because that's not my skill, uh, nor do I believe uh, that's a route for uh, good long term returns in any case. Uh, mm, trading. Uh, has not proven to be a very successful formula for long-term good returns. Uh, the actual evidence at the ground uh, shows that that's not a very successful strategy. So I would, I would be very happy doing the dull and boring uh, long-term investing, but into uh, very, very high-quality ideas, uh, uh, so long as I've bought them at a uh, meaningful discount to what I think is the value, uh, I'll not, on a quirk, want to go away from them because of temporary challenges or adversities. Because it's almost inevitable that some challenges will come uh, on these businesses. And you, so long as they are temporary, you disregard and you move on. That's what uh, I would continue to do. And uh, to my mind, uh, uh, value investing is not some location-specific idea that it works in some territory, it doesn't work in other. I think the principles are universal. So long as they're applied in a correct way, uh, those principles have delivered uh, in the same way. I think 300 years of recorded in the history of investing shows that. So, so you, you largely wouldn't change your mind. Let, let me ask the two people who run very large amounts of money. Maybe I'll start there. You know, you run so much money that that's a constraint. You obviously can't buy very small companies, right? Uh, so suppose you are unconstrained, would, would, your, would your philosophy and your actions be any different from what you currently practice? I think uh, what happens is you, you are, when you are managing other people's money, you want, the problem is there are various points of time when you have to, your goal is to give a good investor experience. And our experience has been that as you go smaller and smaller in company size, maybe the scope of the return is much higher but then the risk is also much higher. So then a year like 2008 appears where you give a very bad uh, experience. So I would say that, uh, you know, trading doesn't work. That is very clear. Uh, investing in an asset class which is, uh, which is very attractive at a point of time, 
and keep waiting and uh, looking for a proper switch instead of trying to identify the exact top of that asset class works. That's what I've seen and there, there are times when you can earn much more return but uh, that comes at higher risk yeah. and uh, if you're managing other people's money, you have to look at not just return, you have to look at risk also. Yeah. No, that, that, that's that, that's sort of a great explanation. I want to, uh, you, you know, the point that you're managing other people's money and therefore investor expectations are extraordinarily important, which sort of brings me into sort of, you know, behavioral finance. And Parag, you're, you're a big expert in behavioral finance. Uh, you've also had experiences, particularly in the dot-com uh, bubble of managing people's expectations. Your recommendations were, 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 were all wrong. Perhaps you can give us a little bit more insight into what you know, what principles of behavioral finance are most important for value investors? First is value investing is all about buying something which is less than the intrinsic value. So it, it's all about common sense. It's no rocket science. And nobody would be buying something which is more than the intrinsic value because then you are looking at the greater fool theory to work that someone would buy it again from you and make you make a profit. Secondly is when you are looking at Value investing, there's a difference between value in use and a value in exchange. <clears throat> Water is an essential commodity for us, which has got a fantastic value in use. But not many people will give you any money for it. And value in exchange is something like a diamond. That it may not be useful to you if you're dying. Water would be useful, but diamond will not be useful but it has got a tremendous amount of exchange value. So when we normally are looking at value investing, we got to realize, realize that just chasing power stocks or something like that, the company will not have a pricing power. It's got a fantastic value in use. But you think those companies will be able to make phenomenal profits for you to really become wealthy over a longer period of time? I doubt so because there are certain constraints on how much the power can be priced at. So, from a behavioral finance point of view, you have to be really sure when is the right opportunity. And there are certain quotes, be fearful when others are greedy, be greedy when others are fearful. If you have the conviction and the patience to really wait for such times, the market will come and give you such times. But from the problem with people is that investors find a stock more risky when nobody is buying and the prices are low. And they find it less risky when everyone is buying and the prices are high. So I think that is what each one has to go for one self-assessment if you want to be successful in the markets. Fabulous. You know, so with that, let's let's open it up uh, to the audience for questions. Uh, uh, feel feel free to shoot uh, any of us on the panel. Yes. We can hear you. I'm not sure if the others can hear you. Yeah. Hello. Ah, okay. This is Deepak Khemani here. My question is this. You identified a value stock and it's there in your value portfolio. At some point, it moves from a value stock to a growth stock. What do you do with it? Just get out of it because your value has been found or you keep on continuing it even though it's no longer a value stock? Can anybody could take that question? Well, if I... <clears throat> I from my point of view, there are no compartments like this. There is no value pocket and there is a growth pocket. As I mentioned, both are uh, like Siami streams and you need to have both in order for you to create economic value. And only if there is an economic value potential in a business that you can hope to have market returns or a market value. It will be, it'll be inconceivable to expect that business doesn't create economic value but yet you can have market returns. That's like uh, buying a thin air. And it is equally inconceivable that there is a great amount of economic value being created 
but market somehow doesn't recognize and there is no market value creation. So neither of that happens, certainly not over a period of time. In a short run, any amount of craziness can prevail. But over a period of time, markets are extremely clinical and precise. I mean, uh, the wisdom of the market on a long run is far, far higher than individual brightness and wisdom of any the wisest man. So there is these artificial barriers and pockets is more a myth in the mind rather than a reality. Thank you. Thank you sir. Yes. Since we've got such wonderful pen. Hello. Uh, I wouldn't like to miss such a, a wonderful opportunity where I can pick uh, such great brains. So, you know, I mean, whenever we uh, hear fund manager, the two most important term one years is business and management. So, here's a question for each of the panelists. What are the four parameters of a good business in your, uh, as per your philosophy, and what are the four parameters of a good management? That, that will take forever. So, so we, you know, let, let's maybe start with a good business since Kenneth is probably the, you know, that's, that's part of his art of craft. Yeah. I think, uh, it all boils down to the fact that the company has been efficient using capital. Okay, one of the parameters that we use uh, to put, put portfolios together is uh, we we quite uh, away from an industry constraint. Uh, our primary focus is to buy capital of capital efficiency, irrespective of where the uh, of irrespective of which industry it comes out of. So I think that's essentially what drives uh, us to put together a portfolio of of, of high high quality businesses. Okay, let's shift to management, and we've discussed this. Maybe you talk, you talk about management because yeah. I think it's one of the biggest challenges in India that uh, you are going to be a minority shareholder, and you have to go to a credible management who really treats its minority shareholders well. So, uh, if I were to list four things, it would be business which I would be able to understand and which is simple to understand, run by a credible management businesses which would have a strong moats around it and also a pricing power. I would look at it that way. I would say on the management, uh, Phil Fisher has described it beautifully. Holy grail of any good management is a, a, a long-term, superior, sustainable return on equity. Thank you very much, and in the interest of uh, keeping this conference on time, I'm going to actually wrap this uh, session up. Uh, but thank you all panelists, and thank you for the audience. Uh, it's been a pleasure.